Alrighty, folks, howdy. This is the video for week, second video for week 11. The first one was the kind of tail end of the video on Rushkoff, the previous video on Douglas Rushkoff on mechanomorphism, so we've already kind of covered some of it. Um, and then this second piece for this week is on data valence. I wonder if you've heard that term before. Um, and the reading is uh, by Roger Clark. He is an Australian scholar of tech surveillance. And um, I came across this little article here when I was putting the syllabus together because I wanted to do something on this topic. And it was the first one that kind of popped out that looked like it would be useful and readable and manageable and, and relevant. Um, and then this morning when I was going back through it, I noticed that it was published in 1988. Um, I was still in high school back in 1988. So my first thought was like, oh, I got to get rid of this thing and come up with something more current. But then I started looking around and, and Roger Clark is like the data valence guy, apparently. Um, and he's written tons and tons about surveillance, data valence. And so I actually linked his, uh, his website uh, where there's lots of additional writings, not on just data valence, but on like surveillance, technology, informatics. Um, but it's a, a wealth of information about this and related topics. And so I had the idea of like, well, let's just go ahead and keep it on uh, the reading list here. But keeping in mind that this is, as I note at the top of the prompt here, just posted this as well, that this is basically ancient history in terms of contemporary understandings of like computer technology, right? Um, I'm trying to think of like when I was in high school, <laughs> like we had computer, I think we had like a computer class, but it was still like typing. Like the computers weren't even really sophisticated enough at that point to even offer classes in like computation. I think there might've been some like, you know, specialty classes in different kind of programs that did like coding and software programming and whatever, but it wasn't a common thing, right? And we didn't have computer labs back then. Um, it, I went to university a few years after this, and that's when they started having computer labs, and that's when the, the internet very first started showing up. In any case, um, what's interesting to me then is, is that this guy, Roger Clark, is writing about data valence way before anyone else was even like you know, before this idea was on the radar, really. So it's interesting how he's able to kind of cover a, a, a range of really important ideas that are still relevant today. But we need to, you know, put an asterisk by this by this reading because whatever he's saying in here is true still today, but with the sort of dial turned up to a maximum level in terms of the kind of concerns part. He's a pretty relaxed kind of a he offers a kind of relaxed approach to this topic he's not an alarmist he doesn't he says right off the bat like i'm not taking the position that all surveillance is evil and all data valence is evil he's basically taking this kind of social science approach and saying like all right what are we talking about here with this surveillance business what is it why does it exist what is it for what are some of its like consequences and implications, thinking about dangers and benefits toward the end there. And then he actually leaves off with some proposals for like, you know, policy changes and like being being careful about this stuff. It's fair to say that none of his like cautionary measures were taken seriously in the intervening 98, 08, 18, 33 years, something like that, right? Um, because whatever he's saying in here is, you know, so much more cranked up. So I have this on the syllabus, but I want to like urge you, it's recommended, I believe on the syllabus, recommended viewing, but it's more strong than a recommendation. It's a supplement, right? So engage these two texts together. Read this one here, follow along with my prompts. So you kind of focus on the key parts and then go on to Netflix. Pretty sure it's still on Netflix. And watch The Social Dilemma, um, which is a documentary about basically where we've come in terms of surveillance, data valence, and the kind of the surveillance economy. Um, I'm just looking at this book on my shelf here, The 
The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. So she just wrote this massive book a couple years ago. It's an economist from Harvard. And basically kind of taking all of this, this stuff and showing kind of where things have come since this thing was written and where we're at right now in terms of like our, our entire economy is, is, is now grounded in data, data valence, data gathering, right? So um, this is the last topic for this third section of the class, which is our environments as persuasion. And, sorry, there's the second last, the penultimate topic. Next week, we're going to look at the binds that blind. That's about the kind of the role of morality and how it gets entangled in all of this kind of tech manipulation. Um, and so, yeah, so we're thinking about environments as persuasive or the way that our environments or the, the, just the everyday kind of stuff that we interact with. We're walking down the street. There's cameras everywhere, you know. Uh, we have cameras on our phones, we have cameras on our watches, we have cameras in our laptops, and I'm here I am recording a video, In my, there's a camera right in my computer. Um, so we were surrounded, we're immersed in these landscapes of digital technology, cameras, microphones, databases, automated processes that are just kind of going about their business, grabbing information wherever they can grab it. So this is an, an absolutely fundamental aspect of our daily existence today. And that's why we're talking about this as a kind of an environmental concern. But what about if you don't kind of aren't aware of it, don't see it, don't feel it? Well, it's still happening and it's still kind of throbbing and pulsating all around us. And, and things are, are moving and things are kind of moving across us and through us. And it's good to be aware of that, especially if we are serious man contenders and we actually do care about kind of the status of our our thoughts and how compromised they might be, right? So that leads us to this first line in this article here. He says, concern about freedom from tyranny is a trademark of democracy. It's a brilliant, perfect opening line. Why are we concerned about all this kind of stuff? Well, if we care about democracy, if we want the, the ability to make decisions collectively, if we want to engage in processes of deliberation and persuasion and cooperation, if we cherish or you know value in some way this notion that our thought patterns can be developed sort of with our own agency, that we can learn things, we can educate ourselves, we can engage in conversations, and that improves the quality of our of our ideas and our thoughts about policy and, and, and strengthens the possibilities of making wise, you know, social policy changes and proceeding and decision making with, with, with integrity, right? If that sort of framework matters and if it's true, then we, yeah, we ought to be concerned about anything that kind of gets in the way of our, of our ability to kind of think in an unmolested way, right? There's always stuff that's kind of impinging on us but like what if most of our thoughts are being kind of engineered or being kind of jacked up by these kind of forces and influences that we're not very aware of and yet they're doing a major job of impacting us right so i love that way he begins there so he's saying you know like we're talking about this stuff because democracy requires some you know defendable measure of cognitive freedom um, from, you know, those who would try to manipulate us, those who would try to distort our thought patterns, those who would try to kind of slip in beneath our defenses and sell us ideas and kind of get us on their side or get us away from this or toward that. All right, so um, there's a lot to be thinking about here and there's a lot to be, I think, concerned about as well in terms of uh, how much of our data is being is being grabbed and done things with and things are being done with it right uh, all right so plenty to be concerned about the social dilemma documentary is really good at getting at the contemporary dynamics but let's just take a quick look through this piece here and we don't need to get super bogged down this is um information technology and data valence so there's a, a fair amount of stuff in here about you know the status of information technology about computation and all of its related um uh technologies supporting it um you know, files, storage kind of technology and sharing technology and all that kind of stuff. So he's really hip to 
what was going on kind of behind the scenes, so to speak, of, of the equipment back then. And he was noting already that there is this kind of tendency toward data gathering. So what's that all about? And he again, he notes right off the bat here, second note on the prompt. Oh, I didn't number these. Oh, well, it's fine. Um, but it's the second star. Boom, right off the bat, concerned about freedom from tyranny. I'm sorry, the next one. Okay, he rejects the premise that surveillance is evil in and of itself. Need to distinguish monitoring against threat from exportation. For right. So right off the bat, it's worth noting that, like, you can think of a spectrum when it comes to surveillance, right? And I'm thinking about, like, the most mild forms of surveillance that we might routinely engage in. And I was thinking about, like, farmer's almanacs from, like, you know, a couple hundred years ago. If you're a farmer, chances are you purchased the yearly almanac, which told you basically everything that happened the previous year in terms of weather patterns. This is before digital computation and databases and information gathering where you can just sort of like recall over the last 20 years what's been happening. Analog book form versions of weather patterns going back in years. And you would want to know this so that you could maybe track possibilities or you could maybe sort of try to anticipate likelihoods right that's all kind of a form of of surveillance or surveillance as he notes here of space visual kind of surveillance spatial surveillance like monitoring what's going on out there right i mean how many of us when we're taking a flight are, are obsessively watching weather patterns right to sort of better understand the likelihood that we're going to make our flight or that there will even be a flight or how long do we have to leave before we you know for the airport before the flight given traffic patterns given weather patterns given the time of year given the fact that there might be some kind of an event going on especially in las vegas if there's a major weekend event kind of thing it could really mess up your ability to get there you want this information you want this data right I think it's a very natural tendency within all of us to like hedge our bets and to get as much information as we can before we act. I am someone who's pretty conservative about this kind of stuff. Like I'm a little risk averse in terms of like making big moves. I want to study it. I want to know. I want to kind of have a feel for what's going on in a certain kind of area before I move into that area. And it's all about like, I don't want to expose myself to a potential threat or an invasion or or you know some unpleasant surprise and so i think you know the the urge to know the urge to like use information to help anticipate possibilities negative possibilities is perfectly normal and natural we do it in our individual lives we do it collectively governments do it all the time businesses do it all the time forecasting anticipating getting as much information as you can but then and there's a kind of tipping point where too much information gives you a kind of unfair advantage. This is like Wall Street kind of stuff. You know, insider trading is illegal because if you're at a company and you know that your product is faulty and it'll never work, but meanwhile your company's promoting itself and you leak out that information that our company's going down because the central product doesn't even work, you can make a lot of money off of a short sale or whatever, right? And the whole movie, The Big Short, was kind of about this. Like getting that information before anyone else so that you can act accordingly and advance your interests, right? So there's a kind of spectrum that we can talk about. And then there's a point at which surveillance and data gathering goes from kind of pragmatic anticipation kind of practices hedging bets, being careful, trying our best to anticipate the future, where that becomes intrusive, invasive, coercive, um, and just kind of like relentless profit making, or it's intrusive in a way that the, the, the subjects of the, the surveillance aren't aware, they don't know that they're being surveilled, they don't know to what end they're being surveilled. So there's a relationship between surveillance and control. More information, more data equals more an increased ability to manage affairs. And so data control, there's a, there's a big relationship there. All right, next, um, he moves into some terms, 499, surveillance, data valence, personal surveillance versus mass surveillance, right? So some distinctions here. Um, but data valence is all about, obviously, information. It's about getting data. Um, and using that data in a specific way. So with this comes the importance of databases, 
storing information, right? And he talks about some of the important aspects of this in terms of like, you need to have like for personal surveillance, you need to have some kind of grounding, anchoring identification, whether it's physiological or something that says this is who or what that thing is. And then everything kind of gets measured against that. Obviously, there's problems when it, when that grounding identity is not certain itself, and then you have all possibilities for confusion, for error, for you know wrongful um, accusations and wrongful whatever. Yeah, the the like fourth prompt there: change is being wrought less by computers themselves than by amalgams of many interacting and mutually supporting technologies. Page five hundred. Right, so the changes that are happening around surveillance aren't just having to do with computers themselves. Computers are processors of data. But you need other things bringing the data into the computer, right? So cameras, microphones, massive databases, ability to share information. So cloud computing becomes very important and useful here, right? So all of these kind of amalgamations of technologies are all evolving in ways that make surveillance and data valence easier, more ubiquitous, more important, right? Let's see. Different ways of data gathering, data valence, lots and lots of technical specificity here. Um, and then I just want to draw attention to like the dangers and the benefits, right? So the benefits, where is this? Um, actually, before that, the data imperative, page 500. That's important. The data imperative, yeah. This is the top right column. As a consequence of the centralizing tendency of early internet technology, or uh, IT, information technology, uh, a data imperative arose with government agencies and private companies alike collecting ever more data, right? So data, oh my goodness, it drives everything today, right? Um, how many times recently have you been offered something for free um, and the cost of that offer is some information about you. How many surveys a week do you get asked to take? I noticed this a few years back already, like literally every day, a new survey, some business, some office on campus, some agency is looking to improve its whatever. And it just wants you to ask a cup, answer a couple quick questions, give it the information. Everyone is trying to gather data. I remember when I was grad coordinator a few years back, we were trying to, you know, make some changes in the program that would better reflect student priorities, values, and whatnot. Well, how do you know that? How do you figure out what student priorities and values are? Create a survey. So I found myself having to go through the same process of creating a survey, even just a casual, simple little survey, and then try to get people to answer this survey and take the survey. And it was maddening. Like, please take my survey. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm getting requests for all kinds of other surveys. And I'm like, screw your survey. I'm tired of surveys, right? So, but data, information, get more information, get the data, build actions based on the data that you've gathered, right? So the data imperative is sort of everything right now. I remember a few years ago, uh, we are uh, State Farm customers, Insurance, car insurance. Uh, I think we have some home insurance as well. Um, and we mostly like State Farm. Uh, good people. And whenever you have a problem, they're like really good with accidents. Um, but they were offering us a promotion that my wife jumped at because she pays the insurance bill. And, and the promotion was, we will give you 5% off of your, of your policy, but you need to let us install this little tracking device in your vehicle. And you have to like stick it in your vehicle and then you have to download the State Farm app. And what's happening is that little tracker is sending signals to the app about where you go, how fast you drive, how frequently you make certain trips, and it just monitors your every literal movement. And you can even go onto the app and you can see for yourself, it uses Google Maps because Google Maps is like the surveillance program and it tells you, it'll tell you what time, how far you drove. And I finally just ripped this thing out of my car and I said, babe, I will give you the money for the 5%, but they are not tracking me anymore. <laughs> I'm really prickly about this kind of stuff. And I, and I don't like the way that they use the, like, you can have it for free or here's a discount. All we want is everything about you kind of idea. So um, for, for me, it feels kind of like a battle for your own sense of of protection, your own privacy, because so much of what we want to do through the internet 
a new program, a new service, right? We just want some information about you. We just need you to sign sign up and add, give us this information. And, and hey, can we like track you? Can we follow you? Um, can we? Can you let us know? You know, Apple. Can you let us know when your phone crashes for whatever reason? Will you share? Will you share? Will you share? Right? Everyone wants personal data. So personal data has become one of the like you know most valuable commodities or resources that we have. It often gets compared to oil. Right? It's like in the old material economy, oil and natural resources were everything. Um, but now the stuff in here and the stuff in how we live our lives and all the information about what we do and where we go and who we associate with, like that's the that's the um, the commodity essentially, or the valuable resource. Just jumping down to the the benefits and the dangers. Five hundred five, five hundred eight. This is getting toward the toward the bottom of the prompt there. So the main benefit of surveillance is security, and I kind of mentioned this at the beginning, right? Information allows us to make probably smarter choices about what's about to happen and, and then guard against possibilities or, you know, swerve around possibilities. Imagine if the Titanic knew that there was an iceberg, iceberg, right, under the water that was about to capsize it. Imagine if it had that surveillance information, it would just go, all right, cool, we're going to go right around there. We want that. We need it. it, it it's important, right? So there's sort of mild surveillance, but then there's the dangers of like rampant sort of unchecked and and um, runaway surveillance, data valence, and things like misidentification, getting you wrong, getting sort of mismatched information about who you are and what you're doing, and that can lead to all kinds of problems. Have you ever had your identity sort of confused or compromised? It's ma- it's ma- it's very maddening. So there's that. There's profiling, right? Because you're the kind of person who does this, then that's the kind of person you are, right? You can be many kinds of things. You can The systems can get the information wrong. Um, harassment, manipulation. So there's lots of dangers. And then the last thing on the, on the prompt here is sort of one of his last points before kind of policy and recommendation stuff. But he's, again, 1988, and he's saying what he did not consider, Orwell, we read some Orwell, what he did not consider was the possibility that the development of the intrusive technology would occur on its own without the spur of totalitarian intent. So back then, the, the, the fear was to, some kind of totalitarian dictator would arise and then would, in, would sort of insist on creating technologies to serve their totalitarian desires. No, no. What about the technology itself emerges in such a way that it helps give rise to dictators and totalitarians and fascistic kinds of, of ways of thinking and relating to people. That is what's happening in the world. We hate, we see totalitarianism, dictatorshipisms, fascisms all over the place. And they're deeply, deeply driven by this, these technologies, the information. There's another documentary on um, Netflix about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. This one gets a little bit more flack and critical flack because it's not quite showing the whole picture, and it's a little bit overly conspiratorial. But what was going on with Cambridge Analytica and this whole Brexit business, um, it's pretty alarming just what you can do with information about voters and likely voting patterns and how you can kind of sway things and manipulate things. Trump, in the first, in his, uh, in his win, used Facebook extensively and, frankly, brilliantly. He used the tools at his disposal to, to send messaging inflammatory messaging and it worked right galvanized opinion continues to work on there in any case i should probably wrap up here um so there's a little bit on data valence and surveillance like i said this is a moderate mild kind of treatment of the topic we need to be a lot more concerned about data valence today and that's why you should go watch the social dilemma because it really gets at the extent to which our just everyday lives, our personal, intimate, private lives are being invaded by free products and all kinds of automated processes that are going after our information and spying on us in ways that we're not really aware of or familiar with. And I know that like, if you don't immediately sense the invasion, you might not be you know, concerned about it, but thinking about the kind of long-term unintended consequences and down, downstream effects of this stuff is, um, is necessary.